Well, it's a lovely autumn morning, coming towards the middle of October, and we've had a little bit of rain, so I'm heading off into the woods, and we'll have a look and see if we can find anything interesting to look at. I'm hoping to find some fungi today. Let's see what we can find. Now you may have noticed I haven't got the dog with me today and that's because we're kind of at the start of deer rutting season. There will be probably somewhere in these woods large herds of deer and I'd have to keep Eva on the lead which is not really fun for either of us. I've been to this area before and it's usually pretty abundant with fungi. This year we've had a really dry summer and there's not a lot about. Uh, we, down here we've got a couple of very immature hedgehog fungus and one that's kind of over there. So one that's too small to pick, one that's too eaten to pick. So we'll leave those. I'll have a look around because we might find some more. Haven't really looked very thoroughly yet so there's hope that we might find something else. But yeah it's been such a dry summer I think the fungi just haven't really got started. In the summertime, the underground mycelia of the fungi will grow and spread and build up their energy for reproduction in the autumn. And it's the reproductive structures, which is the things we call mushrooms. Most of the fungus organism is underground. And so, yeah, there's another one there. That's another hedgehog fungus, I think, but not worth picking. And there'll always be things like this. Not even really sure what that is, but we won't be picking that. But sometimes seeing fungi like this is a hopeful sign that other things will be around. So we'll keep looking. You may or may not be able to hear sounds of traffic in the distance. We're not that far from a busy road and that's kind of normal in the UK. There aren't any massive swathes of wilderness. And so most places you go, you're not going to be very far from civilization. Apart from maybe places like Dartmoor or the Scottish Highlands. But down here in the south of England, it's really a case of woodland is the bits between the roads. So here, don't know what that is, but we'll be leaving it alone. And over there, I think probably a deceiver, but not sure. I'm not going to muck about with these and disturb them. I don't intend to pick that, so I'm going to leave it be. And down here, are uh, these might be, yeah, these are tiny juvenile hedgehog fungus. But again, too small to pick, not worth bothering with. I'll just leave them to grow on. However, we're finding a few things now, so, you know, hope begins to grow. And down here, Amethyst Deceiver, which is a edible fungus. And usually, if you find one, you find thousands of them. And now some people have voiced concerns about eating the Amethyst Deceiver in the past, apparently it can bioaccumulate arsenic. I don't think there's a great cause for concern in this area. It's not like we're wandering in woodlands that are on top of mine tailings or anything like that in, in a soil that's got a high level of natural arsenic. One of the other things people quite often ask me about British woodland is where's the understory layer? Why is it so open at ground level like this? There's a couple of reasons for that, especially in this bit of woodland here. We're in the New Forest. New Forest being the name of the place. 
not a description anymore. It's around about a thousand years old. Anyway, so the reason there isn't very much understory here is that it's grazed by deer, by horses, cattle, and so anything that's above deer grazing height, in fact, if you look across the thing here, you can see there's a kind of line, there's a grazing line, and that's as tall as the deer can reach. So anything below that tends to get munched, anything above that tends to grow. So that's one of the reasons there's no understory layer here, or not much understory layer here. The other one is that this is a managed woodland. This is not a piece of wilderness forest. This is a managed piece of woodland here. This is a tree farm. So the Forestry Commission will come through here every few decades or so and harvest the trees. And it's a crop. And then they will either replant or just allow to grow naturally. And yeah, the, the woodland here is basically a tree farm. Now, of course, it obviously has utility for wildlife while it's growing, but this is not your wilderness forest. This is a piece of managed woodland. Okay, also down here, don't know what these are, and I'm gonna leave them alone. I do realize that I say that quite a lot with various fungi, but that's part of my kind of foraging methodology. I haven't got the books with me. I know what I'm looking for today. And I'm going to be picking, really, probably only specimens out of a selection of a couple of dozen species. Those are more hedgehog fungi down there, but again, not looking great, so I'm going to leave them. And if we continue to find that there just aren't very many fungi about, I am quite prepared to return home with an empty basket today. It's really a case of... I tend to only pick mushrooms if I find them in abundance so that I can leave at least as much as I take. Okay, different camera because the battery ran out on the other one. Apologies for that. So we've got a fallen beech. But we've got several things going on here as this branch of beech tree decays. So some sort of fungus there. Don't know what that is. Oyster mushrooms here and here. Probably not quite worth picking but I will look around because usually when you find oyster mushrooms, you'll find more nearby. And then also porcelain fungus. Now this is edible, and I'll make a decision on whether to pick this or not. But this, this commonly grows on fallen beach, and it is edible, and it's, got this, it's always got this kind of slimy wetness to it on the top, which can be washed off and Apparently it's quite a nice edible fungus after that, so I probably should give it a try. I found some more of the porcelain fungus. I decided I'm not going to pick this today because I don't know it well enough. I'm going to go home, research it some more, read up on it, make sure that I'm really, really confident on identifying it. I'm 99% sure that's what this is, but 99% isn't good enough for me. So I'm going to read up on it some more and make sure that next time I encounter it, I can identify it 100%. I'll also read up on the culinary uses of it and if it's worth picking, next time I might get some. Just here, that's evidence of the reason why I can't bring Eva here in this time of year. This is a scrape. This is where deer have been scraping out and marking the ground. So the stags will scrape out the ground and mark it with their urine, which contains pheromones. And they will try to assemble their harem here. So the deer have been here. I would say it's actually not all that fresh actually so probably a day or two ago but i have seen fresher scrapes than that today and i've seen quite a lot of fresh deer droppings so they are around i don't know that i'll encounter them today i'm probably making too much noise talking to the camera and so here we've got evidence of how this is a managed forest so this area here has been planted it looks like it might have been a track at one point actually and they've planted oak trees and they've got these plastic tubes around them which I believe is to deter deer and rabbits from chewing the bark off and sometimes that works although I don't know what happens to the plastic afterwards it always just seems to end up as a piece of litter in the forest I 
don't know that this is biodegradable. It doesn't appear to be rotting down. I think that just becomes waste, which is a shame. Okay, editing shrimp here, and something went a bit wrong with my camera here, or rather, I went a bit wrong in operating my camera here. I'm testing out a new GoPro, and I must have pressed the wrong button or something. All I got was high-speed footage with no audio for probably the most important part of the foraging footage, which is the things I picked. I did find a few specimens of Boletus edulis, that's the sep or penny bun or porcini. I found some that were too small to pick. I found some that were a bit too damaged to pick, but I found two decent specimens and a few chanterelles and hedgehog fungus. So this is what my basket looked like as I was heading back towards the car. Okay, time to head out now, I think, along what is undoubtedly a deer track here. i find somewhere to sit down, have a cup of coffee and a snack, and then we'll decide what to do next. I don't like wading through bracken where the deer have been tracking through because that's prime territory for ticks. Uh, also, <laughs> okay, looks like I've got a little bit of tightrope walking to do here. Wish me luck. Made it. Wouldn't have been surprised to find the deer out on the open here, actually, during the day. Anyway, the, uh, ew, the sky is starting to bruise a bit, so I'm going to make sure I don't get too far from the car. So it does look like I'm heading into an area of woodland where it might be a little bit more productive. I'm seeing more and more fungi, nothing I want to pick, but seeing more and more fungi about. And actually the ground does seem more moist underfoot. So I presume that's to do with drainage and you know the lay of the land and all that sort of thing. So as I say, this is all managed woodland, managed forest. And it's uh managed by the Forestry Commission, who harvest the timber from it for timber products, other woodland products, to make charcoal, all sorts of things. When I first visited this area many, many years ago, this area to my left here had just been clear felled. So apart from these very tall pine trees, which were here all along, this whole area here had been completely cleared and it looked like a barren wasteland. And I, th I don't think it's even been planted, to be honest, but up here we've got birches growing. We've got various conifers. I think those might be cypress or something like that, or maybe larch. But uh, so nature wants to grow things on this land. So when humans clear it, unless they keep it clear, it will tend to return to forest. That's what it wants to do. Yeah, all of this is, all of this was clear felled. A very old dead tree there. I wonder if that's an old elm tree that's died. There's a little beech tree growing up next to it. But I wonder if those are the st skeletons of old elm trees that were killed off by the Dutch elm disease. Ah, now, here's a, here's a thing. Amanita muscaria. Now, about 50% of the time, maybe more, but a lot of the time when I find Amanita muscaria, I search the surrounding area and I find Boletus sedulis nearby. Now, I might not be lucky today, so that might not be true today. Or it may have been true and maybe somebody's come along and picked them, or maybe something's eaten them. But, it's consistent enough a rule for me to, when I see Amanita muscaria to have a little scout around and see if I can find Boletus edulis growing nearby. Doesn't look like doesn't look like that's the case today. I think I'll just cut through here actually. Now I don't know whether that's because they like the same conditions or because they have some kind of relationship. It's possible. Gonna have to be really quick. Another deer scrape there, a very fresh one. That's what my basket contains. I can see more Amanita muscaria over there. I think my battery's about to die. 
So not a massive haul of fungus, two nice seps, a few hedgehog fungus and a few chanterelles. Not bad and good enough for a little omelette. Editing shrimp again here. So I returned home with this basket of mushrooms and the chanterelles and the hedgehog fungi I did have in an omelette for my breakfast the next day. However, the seps were a bit of a quandary. As a sautéed or otherwise freshly cooked mushroom, I find them a bit slimy and uninteresting in texture. So I decided to do something a little bit different with them. I heard of a recipe where you can make something that supposedly resembles battered seafood, scampi, out of fresh seps. So I thought I'd give that a try. So I've got these lovely porcini mushrooms, these Bolita sergilis, or sep, or penny bun, whatever you want to call them. And I've just given them a little clean. I've trimmed off the dirty bits of the roots. I'm going to give them a little wipe over with a damp piece of kitchen paper towel. I'm not washing them. The underside of this mushroom is like a sponge. And washing it would just completely fill it up with water and make it inedible. This bit here is where a slug or a snail has chewed away at the underside i'm not very worried about eating something that has been in contact with the mouth parts of an invertebrate it doesn't bother me so just get those cleaned up to good enough that's good enough for me now what i'm going to try to do with these is make fake scampi so in the uk scampi refers to deep fried breaded shrimp or prawns usually made from longestines actually so I know, I know scampi can mean other things in other places but in the uk it typically means breaded deep fried crispy prawns so i'm going to cut these mushrooms up just check that they're okay inside they're lovely no signs of maggot infestation or anything in there and then i'm going to cut this into little pieces kind of little bite size. In fact, what I think I'll do is I'll just cut into quarters, into eighths, what's that, sixteenths. Gonna leave it like that, I think, actually. I was gonna take the gill material away, but these are such lovely firm specimens. I think I'm just gonna leave them like that. So cut them up into, I'll do some slightly thicker ones as well, and we'll see how that goes. That's good. And then the same with this smaller one. Look at that lovely firm mushroom with no sign of anything wrong with that. Sometimes when you get these uh, seps, they're full of maggots, typically when they're bigger than this. And it, it varies from year to year. Some years there just seems to be an overwhelming number of fungus gnats and other years none at all. I'm also going to cut up the stalks here into little discs because I have a feeling that when those are cooked they might be a little bit like scallops. The stalks I might put in the stock pot they look a little bit too fibrous to use for anything else. So anyway we've got these bits of mushroom here and I've got to now come up with a kind of coating for them that's going to make them a bit like seafood. So the first bit of that is going to be these nori sheets which I'm going to pulverize into a powder. So I think probably just one sheet will be enough, or half a sheet, as this is here. And I'm going to put this in this little coffee grinder, and I'm hoping that we will be able to reduce it to a fairly fine powder. Okay. Nori dust. Don't breathe this. So that's going to go into my dish right there. Next, just about a tablespoon and a half of plain flour, a little pinch of salt, half a teaspoon of paprika, sweet paprika for a little bit of sweetness. To continue the kind of seafoody vibe, we're gonna use some of the juice out of these pickled gherkins. These are Polish pickles in dill vinegar. Mm, nice. I'm actually going to use about three tablespoons of that dill vinegar and then just enough water to make a fairly tight batter. Now, I'm not worried about the color of this. This is just going to be to stick the breadcrumbs onto the mushrooms. Now that doesn't look too appetizing. It does smell quite seafoody. Obviously that's the seaweed. 
but I think the dill probably helps as well because it's got a association with the flavour of fish. Next I've got some panko bread crumbs and now all I'm going to do with my pieces of porcini is drop them into that seafoody batter and then make sure that they're all kind of coated. We really just need to make sure all the surfaces are dressed because this is going to be the glue that sticks the breadcrumbs to them. I've got a tray that I'm just going to line with a non-stick reusable sheet and then the plan is we get a piece of mushroom, we toss it around in the breadcrumbs until it's coated nicely and then out onto this tray and that's going to be our little fake scampi piece. Now of course we're not using any egg or anything like that, this is just a flour based batter to stick these panko breadcrumbs on. So deep fried battered scampi is a kind of pub classic in the UK. Scampi and chips is something that's kind of a bit of a maybe a 1980s, 1970s pub classic that's been revived a few times. It can be a little bit disappointing because when you cook longestines in, in batter, when you deep fry longestines inside a batter shell, very often they kind of disappear almost and there's almost nothing left inside the shell. It's just a very disappointing little wisp of, of seafood inside the shell. I'm hoping these will be different from that, but the expected texture is actually quite soft. So mushrooms might work quite well for that. I haven't bothered trying to shape these. I could have tried to cut them so that they were prawn shaped, but I think we would just lose some of the material then. So I'm more concerned about actually preserving as much as I can of the actual mushroom and wasting as little as possible. If everything I'm doing here looks a little bit awkward, it's because I'm working late at night and I'm, I've got uh, one of my studio lights down here in the kitchen so that I can continue working. And everything's a little bit awkward. I'm leaning over things to actually get to the worktop here. So it's all a little bit makeshift. I hope it comes across okay. The next bit will be back in daylight, hopefully. Okay, so those are my scampi style mushroom pieces. I'm going to put those now in the freezer because I'm thinking that will help to keep the batter in a shell when I cook them. So those are going to go in the freezer overnight and we'll cook them tomorrow. Okay, and to go with this fake scampi, we're going to make some tartar sauce. And to keep everything kind of plant-based, uh, even though mushrooms of course aren't plants, I'm using vegan mayo as the base for that. So I've got a generous teaspoonful of capers. I'm going to take one of these gherkins. I probably won't use the whole thing because I don't actually need that much tartar sauce. And then we're just going to cut that up into small cubes. Really smaller cornichons would have been better for this because they're a little bit more firm, got a bit more crisp and bite to them. I'm just going to run the knife through those, through those capers a little bit as well to open them up and release some of the flavour. But I don't want to completely reduce them to nothing. Okay, and then this lot goes into a small bowl. We'll have a big squeeze of this vegan mayo. Tiny bit pale just because the vegan mayo doesn't have egg yolks in it so we'll just give that a tiny squirt of ketchup just to make it a, a, a tiny bit towards a Mary Rose sauce. There we go, that looks good. Let's give it a taste. It's good. Right, that can go in the fridge until we're ready to serve. And just before I fry those mushroom breaded pieces, which are in the freezer right now, I'm going to give them another breadcrumb coating, just to make them extra crispy on the outside. This is uh, self-raising flour though, this time. So this will hopefully give a little bit of a light batter on the outside, just to really create a proper batter shell. Just flour and water there. I am going to season that just with some mixed herbs, a tiny pinch of salt, and again this is just a glue to stick the panko breadcrumbs on. I set aside the breadcrumbs we used yesterday evening, so these have got some little bits of batter from yesterday but they're still good, so we didn't, I didn't want to use more. 
So these are the frozen mushroom pieces that I breaded yesterday evening. So I'm just going to move these pieces up to one end of the tray and then run them through this kind of breading process once more. So we just roll them in the, the sticky, plonk them into the breadcrumbs. And this probably isn't necessary, but I do want a really nice crisp batter shell on here. I am making quite a mess here, but I'll tidy that up in a moment while we're waiting for the boil to come up. Right, the thrumming sound, if you can hear it, is my oven. It's the fan oven. I am having chips with this and we're having oven chips. And because the chips are not the star of the show here, the hopefully fake scampi will be. So I've got about a centimeter of oil here in this pan. I'm using a non-stick pan because I don't really want to deep fry. I'm just going to fry these and hopefully the non-stick will stop them from sticking right to the bottom. Right, the oil is coming up to temperature, so a few at a time. I'm just going to drop these in. They are quite cold, so they will chill the oil a little, little bit. I probably won't dump them all in at once, or else we'll end up shocking the oil and cooling it down too much. There might be room for them all. I actually also don't want to cook them too fast, because I don't want them to burn on the outside and still be raw inside, so I've got to kind of moderate the heat a little bit here. Well, there's a really savoury aroma coming off of this already, that's amazing. Okay, and what I'm just going to do is make a little bit more space now. Just start adding in the others. Some water will come out of the mushrooms, and I don't want that to spit too much. If it does, I've got the splatter guard on standby. And then also on standby over here, I've got some kitchen paper towel on a plate to take them out and drain them when they're cooked. That's kind of the level of golden I want on the all sides of most of them. So I think we're almost there. And interestingly, it does smell a bit seafoody. I think that's probably just the seaweed cooking, but probably also the, the kind of aromas from the mushrooms. Right. Most of those are now going to come out and drain. Well, it kind of looks the part. I'll just give those a little shimmy on that paper, just to turn them over and bring each surface into contact with the paper so they can drain that much better. Right, well, so here it is. This is fake scampi made from porcini mushrooms. So Jenny helps self. And we've got some chips and peas with this. and then some of that vegan tartar sauce, and a little squeeze of lemon. Perhaps just a little bit of salt, either, and pepper. So that is the fake scampi. A nice crisp batter shell, that's good, a crisp, crisp sort of breaded shell. Okay, not powerfully seafoody. Although, I mean, it's nice enough, isn't it? Yeah. They're savoury. The, the porcini mushrooms are lovely and savoury. They've got a sort of powerful umami kick, kick to them. Actually, I'm going to say that second one I had was a little bit more convincing. So, is it a, a faithful replica of Scampi? It's not really, is no. it? No. Is it as nice as Scampi in its own right? I think it is, actually. Yeah. Mm. I think as an alternative to seafood. I mean, it's, yeah, it's lovely, fine. lovely mushrooms. I think that was worth doing. So there we go. I hope that was interesting. That's fake porcini scampi made from foraged porcini mushrooms. I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.